So our next speaker is Dr. Fatima Jackson. Um, So she is going to talk about her work, which has been highly, highly influential in understanding the role of ethnicity in, uh, in the United States in particular. So this is another one of those uh, critical conceptual frameworks that most of us have, need to make sure that we understand to include and, in, and inf in, inform our work. Dr. Jackson. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> it's a great honor to be here, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Usually I have to do a, a Skype conference, and it's just not the same, you know? Uh, a lot of emphasis is on virtual this and virtual that, but there's nothing like being here in the flesh, seeing people that I care about. Okay. Okay, sorry for this. This is just taking a little time. I have to get dressed. <laughs> I'm going to need to put this right on here. Is that okay? okay, that's fine. Put it wherever you need to put it. Okay, all right. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, I like to move around, so this is good for me. Okay, so um, that's me. I'm um, a director of the Cobb Research Lab, in addition to being a professor of biology at Howard University. And uh, I wanted to say something just briefly about the Cobb Research Lab, because our, our meeting today, uh, in fact, over the last couple of days, we've been talking about health disparities and social justice and so forth. Now, the Cobb Research Lab holds uh, 400 years of African American biological history. We have human skeletal and dental remains from the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century and the 20th century. And from these remains, we're able to extract DNA. And so these are very exciting times at the Cobb Research Lab because we're able to, to fill in some of the spaces, some of the information on the historical antiquity of various health disparities. And, and to what extent has selection occurred within the African American community in particular? Uh, about 85, 83% of our skeletal and, and dental sample is African or African derived. And so we think that research on this collection is really going to present some new perspectives for us on some of the major killers, contemporary killers of, of peoples of African descent. Um, Dr. Montague Cobb, who was really a luminary among among intellectuals, he put together this uh, collection uh, of, um, of mainly, as I said, African Americans, because he wanted to have the hard evidence to show that there is no uh, biological basis for racism. You know, in science, the one with the most data wins. And so what he has provided us with is a database that is unheralded in, in the rest of the country, in fact, in the world, that will allow us to study genetic, epigenomic, uh, all kinds of metabolomic changes, anything that we can pull out of the DNA, pull out of the, out of the bone, we can uh, uh, use in reconstructing historical patterns of susceptibility. And I think it's going to give us a lot of insight. And, and I want to open up my lab the Cobb Research Lab, to any of the researchers here who are very interested in looking at the historical basis of some of the diseases that they're currently interested in. So please think about it. We have a few Europeans in the collection and even a few Asians, but the majority of the collection are African Americans. And so we're hoping that 400 years of biological history will allow us to say some new things in the coming years you know, and put some old biases to rest as well. So the problem as I see it, or the problems as I see it, 
is that uh, human diversity and heterogeneity and biocultural variability, you know, it just doesn't fit into that, that little racial model. You know, that racial model is increasingly uncomfortable. Uh, maintaining the racial model, the classical stratification model based upon on social and cultural categories has always been uncomfortable and unjust, but it thrived in an, in an environment of ignorance. And as we become less ignorant, as we become more knowledgeable about the overlap in our genetics as well as the dissimilarities in our genetics, we realize that we need better models. We have to make more sense out of what we have. We can't use the same old models from, from years gone by. And I've written here that the quest for precision medicine rests upon a platform of accurate genomic studies, coupled with sophisticated interpretations of the environmental context of genomic diversity. So that's really a tall order. Those are fancy words, but actually addressing this is more complicated than we might imagine. Why? Because we don't have the reference databases for Native Americans. In fact, Native Americans are so decimated, you all don't even look like each other. <laughs> so, you know, that's the effect of genocide. And African Americans are coming from an African genomic database, which is highly evolved, lots of genetic diversity. And then to, to that, we add modest gene flow from non-African peoples, mainly Europeans and Native Americans. Again, the, the, the actual Native American groups or the actual African groups and even the, the actual uh, Europeans um, all depend upon where in the country or where in the, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere you happen to come from. We need these new approaches. The race model doesn't work. And health disparities are the end products of complex interactions. And these complex interactions, they really defy simplistic solutions. So I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, and I'm looking at the faces and realizing, you guys already believe this, so. I can say it. <laughs> well, you know, this is where we charge up. This is where we get the ammunition to go and fight the battles against the many, many, many of our colleagues who, who can't see beyond black or white, who have no place even for Asians, even though the majority of humanity is Asian. <laughs> Precision medicine will not emerge from an ahistorical recreational genetics. So a lot of this fake genetics that's going around where you pay money and they tell you, oh, you're Hausa, and your, your mom is Yoruba, and your daddy's Igbo. It's like, what? <laughs> that's, that's not real genetics. Genetics has to be within, has to be interpreted within a historical framework that's accurate. And so the precision medicine is not going to come out of that. We really need systematic approaches that understand the structure and bio population biology of our species. And my colleague has already preempted me by talking a lot about anthropology. You know you've been talking about it without a license. I'm going to start practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> That's okay, I love you. <laughs> we have to fine tune our studies to become specific for particular subgroups because just because the story of what was going on with one group of humanity doesn't mean that that's the story for all of humanity. Because we are substructured. We are substructured, and that's an important point to make. So I think that if we're going to capture the nuance of human biological diversity, then we have to have models that are integrative. And that probably means that we need to have better statistics so that, that we can better analyze this complex diversity that we're encountering. The, the models have to include relevant cultural and behavioral diversity, because obviously culture and behavior can influence gene expression patterns, right, through epigenomics. Uh, we have to have better reference databases for genetic and genomic variation, because we cannot rely simply upon the, the HAP map uh, Yoruba population to explain all the variation in Africa. It just doesn't make any sense. 
Non-genetic biological differences, such as those induced by protracted contact with specific environments, need, that needs to be integrated into our models. It does make a difference what you eat. It makes a difference what diseases you're exposed to and what diseases your mama was exposed to. <laughs> I like going into the patois. I'm so glad to be at Howard. You know I can talk like that and people understand exactly what I'm saying. It matters who your daddy was and what your daddy ate and what diseases he was exposed to. Why? Because that's going to influence your own epigenomic profiles. And we have to have an awareness of these appropriate biological lineage histories. So I thought, and I'm trained in biological anthropology, I'm a human biologist, I thought that this concern that I learned for human genetic and environmental diversity and the integration of that, that now it seems in the 21st century we seem to be ready to integrate. You know, we seem to be moving beyond the, the genocentrism of the 1990s and into a 21st century where we really are ready to, to uh, consider multiple causative models, you know? And I think that that's ver that speaks very well. Um, I thought that uh, this perspective would be very useful, especially if, as we talked about health disparities, we also considered human evolutionary history um, and population biology. And we really started, look instead of looking for blanket expressions of what's going on with the people, that we really looked at small uh, uh, micro groups. Uh, instead of trying to say, well, Hispanics X, Y, and Z, we can say, no, this particular group of Latino people, this is what's happening with them, but may not be happening with the, the Latinos down the block, okay, because they're eating something different, they have a different genetic background, and so forth and so on. In other words, we need to be more careful. We talk about precision medicine. We need precision science. We need to stop jerking around here and saying <laughs> crazy things about masses of people and we don't know what we're talking about and then we make it policy. And the, and the, and the disparities perpetuate. They perpetuate because of our ignorance. I'm absolutely convinced of that. See, when you get old, you get to say all these things. <laughs> So I've been around the block a little bit and I've seen too much ignorance, you know, masquerading as, as, as what we need is precision science. Give us precision science and so we see each other for the complex entities that we are rather than uh, as models for some ethnic group. All right, you've seen this, mo you've seen this diagram, of course, uh, and you've had to talk about the emergence of modern humans. Of course, you know that there were successful migrations of subsets of modern humans out of Africa uh, fairly early on. Uh, and it wasn't as though people were saying, let's leave Africa, we can't take it anymore. <laughs> no, it's like, let's, let's go follow the meal. You know, there's climate change going on in Africa. And we should never think that all of the people left Africa. It was a small subset of people that left Africa. So the majority of humanity remained in Africa. Their story still needs to be told. It hasn't been told. And until we can understand the patterns of genetic variation in Africa, it's hard to understand the patterns of variation in the African diaspora. Do you feel me? So the people in the other world, I love this picture of these brothers. <laughs> Quite got, got their little get up here. <laughs> And of course, we can trace the maternal lineages by following the mitochondrial DNA trails. We can ta trace the paternal lineages by uh, tracking the Y chromosome and the changes in Y chromosome, that is, the mutations in Y chromosome. And it's very interesting. And, and even at this level, it tells us that there is complexity, that, that the females were not simply following the males around, that there is nuance. Um, you've had a little bit of exposure to this about the, the uh, uh, admixture of, of uh, archaic humans with anatomically modern humans. And of course, uh, this is, by the way, is Chris Stringer, who's a, a one of my colleagues at the, at the uh, British Museum. And he's done some of the most important anatomical work on Neanderthal specimens from Europe. Um, modern humans 
uh, seem to have emerged probably as a hybrid species. What does that mean? That means that fundamentally, and this is what I tell my classes at Howard, fundamentally we're lovers. That is, we come across another species and we have the option of either killing them or making love, and we usually make love. <laughs> I think that's a very hopeful thing, don't you? Isn't that way more pleasing than I see, I wonder who that is, I think I'll kill them, as opposed to I wonder who that is, let's date, you know? <laughs> All right. Dr. Rubio, you made my, my talk a whole lot easier. I don't have to go through all the anthropology. I can tell jokes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a diagram of biological lineage coalescence, and it's probably far more complicated than it needs to be. The thing to remember is this. Each of you has two parents, right? Anybody got more than two parents? No, biologically, I mean. No. <laughs> biologically, you only have two, no matter who you claim. Okay. And then you have have, of course, four grandparents, and then the, as you go back in time, the number of direct ancestors, ancestors is going to increase, right? Okay, but as, and, and, and you know, you've seen a good example of this. As you go back in time, the number of actual people on the planet decreases. So if the number of your ancestors as you go back in time increases, but the number of people on the planet decreases, then it means that ultimately we're all related to each other, right? Okay, so that's biological lineage coalescence. Means that our lineages coalesce. They come together. So it's just a matter of time before we find out, you know, how closely related each of us are to the other. Something to keep in mind when, when the haters show up, <laughs> right? So the central problem is that from an evolutionary point of view, we're essentially the same person from an evolutionary point of view. Each of us could substitute for another from an evolutionary point of view. So if a creature came from Mars and wanted an example of a human, why, well, I'd send you. <laughs> <laughs> You'd substitute for me. <laughs> the evolutionary superficiality reflects the genetic redundancy of modern humanity and the transient nature of gene-environment interactions. However, this is not the same as the more immediate clinical significance of human biodiversity. So at the clinical level, the differences among us are a big deal. At the evolutionary level, no, not really. Genes and gene-environment interactions do contribute to existing population-level health disparities, and they are at the core of designing precision into our medical interventions. They're at the core of that precision science that I'm saying we need to have. But don't, not to get the stuff confused, a, a difference in a particular metabolome between people of predominantly African descent and people of European descent doesn't put them into two different races. It's not of evolutionary significance. And there's still so much tremendous overlap in all the different world populations that we're still trying to figure this thing out. So it's not time for, for resegregation. It's really time for uh, more clarification of the nuance of human diversity. And it's that nuance that is going to help us ameliorate the health disparity. The evolutionary and the clinical perspectives on human diver diversity represent two levels of analysis. And as a result, we tend to distort our perceptions, our interpretations of the diversity we encounter, and we misunderstand its relationship to persistent health disparities. So we overstate our case. Black women have small babies. All black women? Everywhere? We haven't even done that research. Only black women under certain kinds of environmental situations, certain kinds of nutritional situations. And then small baby, what does that mean in terms of development? So there's so many avenues, so many other complex aspects to any of these gross pronouncements 
that we should be very careful in making them. We fall short of developing accurate precision medicine because our foundations are compromised and inadequate. That's that imprecision in the science that I'm talking about. So let's look at some of the factors that distort our perceptions of human variability. I mean, for the, for the first is that just when you look at the world population, really you see 1950, which is right around here. 1950, you get a real upswing in the number of people surviving in economically developed countries. That's largely because of interventions in public health, you know? Uh, uh, changes in our ability to control harmful pathogenic microorganisms. So you get this big increase in the number of people surviving in the blue area in developing countries. In industrialized countries, not so much. Not such a big bump, okay? Um, in terms of the geographical distribution of the current world population, I, I said that most people on the planet are Asian. That's really, really, really true and it's been true for a very long time. 61% uh, of humanity is Asian, and the most common phenotype, the most common human, is Han Chinese and female. So I guess when the guy from Mars comes, we'll find a Han Chinese female and let her go in our place, okay? But that's, I mean, it's, it's do we even take that into account sitting in the U.S., where we tend to think of, of Asian, and Asia, by the way, who knows what that is? That's from Beirut to Tokyo. So that's a huge area. It's kind of like Latino. Like, what does that mean, genetically? What does it mean? No, nobody knows. But that population that we say inhabits Asia um, is absolutely huge. And uh, yet, when we talk about drugs for the world, how many East Asians and South Asians are involved in those tests? In terms of changing regional origins of the U.S. population, this is just represents 100 years. At the beginning of the, the 20th century, most of the immigrants came from Europe. But by the end of the 20th century, this is to the United States, a, a very small minority came from Europe. Most of the immigrants were coming from Latin America or from Asia. So that even within a 100-year span, population demographics can change dramatically. But we always seem to be a step behind in our thinking. Uh, we also have a lot of mythology about our origins, and um, this, this uh, map is a demographic map, but it matches very much the uh, uh, 23 and Me maps that uh, Dr. Reveal showed. So this is showing the counties with the predominant ethnic group, self-identified ethnic group presence in, in those counties, okay? So uh, the counties are listed, I mean, the, the ethnic groups are listed here, and I'm sorry, the resolution is so bad. The main thing is for you to see that most of the African Americans who are in the, the, the dark lavender, okay, or the purple, most are in the southern areas, the southern, southeast part of the United States interesting that those are the same places that the big plantations were when our people were enslaved. Most of the people calling themselves Mexican-American are right along the border with Mexico. That's that pink group right down there. And um, those are, they, if you ask them, they would say that they're just in northern Mexico. <laughs> um, uh, the blue, the light blue, are the people who say that they are predominantly of Germanic descent. And you can see that they're broadly distributed, no? In, in fact, that's probably the, the, the second, maybe even the largest uh, European-American ethnic group, even though we are speaking English. And the people who say that they're primarily of English origin are in the yellow, uh, light yellow down here. And some of those people, if you ask them, who are you? They say, well, I'm, I'm American. You say, no, no, but where did your people come from? And they'll say, well, I'm Scotch or I'm Irish, you know? And they were intentionally brought in. Story I'm trying to make, and I think you can see it from this map, is that we're not a, we're not a, a melting pot. We have regional distinctions, and those regional distinctions have to be taken into account. 
the uh, groups that we call Native Americans, just to show you the effects of the genocide, this whole map used to be uh, this kind of orange-yellow, and now you just see it in isolated spots. So that kind of demography has an impact on the genetics. So I want to talk about genes in the abiotic environment, genes in the biotic environment, and genes in the sociocultural environment, because I think that we, we use this term environment, but we may not be clear about what, we're, what, ex, what part of the environment we're talking about. And some parts of the environment are more modifiable than others. Um, so this is, these are two studies that were done, and these are two studies that were done you know, very competently, ostensibly on the same population, but they found different results. So in the first study, Adiemo, um, he looked at um, some SNPs uh, for systolic blood pressure, and he found this set of genes, uh, PS, uh, PMS1, SLC24A4, uh, uh, WYAT7, IP07, and CACANA1H. And he said, these are the genes that cause susceptibility to high blood pressure in African Americans, or at least elevated systolic blood pressures. And, and then a few years later, uh, Kidambo came along and did the same study, and he couldn't confirm any of the genes found by Adiemo's group. <laughs> so was somebody lying? Was somebody cheating? Or was there differences? Was there embedded social, embedded population substructure in the African Americans they studied. So that even though they both studied African Americans, one of them may have studied a group of African Americans in one part of the range, and another, a group of African Americans in another region. And the differences between those two groups of African Americans may have been as distinct as the differences between Latinos from Dominican Republic and Latinos from Puerto Rico. Two different groups, different diets, different, different patterns of inheritance. Clearly, African Americans exhibit some level of population substructure, and that befuddles our efforts at singular classification. And so as we talk about health disparities and social justice, there can be no social justice without, without uh, sensitivity to regional nuance because being black in Alabama is not the same as being black in Alaska. It's just not the same. The, the stresses are not the same. The environment's not the same. The overlying cultural milieu is not the same. So we've developed this technique called ethnogenetic layering, which is just a computational technique, but we've been working on it for well over 20 years now. In fact, we were working on it before a lot of our uh, um, census data was actually computerized. And we'd go through the, the census tables by hand. It was so tedious and so depressing, too. But, you know, after a while, you start to see patterns emerging. And what, what we, once the, we had the computer programs, such as geographical information systems, uh, to come in, what we could do, we could take this ethnogenetic layering we could take the genetic information for a region and then digitize it and then layer it horizontally and then layer information on toxin levels or layer information on whatever it was we were interested in uh, and then sample vertically. So your whole geography constant and you have these layers like layers of a cake and then you sample through the layers and then when you pull that out just like you're pulling a plug from a watermelon, it's going to tell you what's going on at, that, at those geographical coordinates at that point in time. You guys understand what I'm saying? OK, so when you do that, you get a picture of that, ge those geographical coordinates. You get a picture of what's happening right there that you would not get if you only looked at each of those layers individually. So we couple this with advances in genetic variation detection and analysis, like as genome-wide association studies, using and we, we bring in bioinformatics 
and we are trying to develop these more nuanced understandings of the interactions of among genetics, the environment, and disease, so that we can figure out what exactly is going on on South on uh, Sunny Side Houston, as compared to what's going on on the West Side of Chicago, because the populations may look similar, but may be very different. So these are some of the factors that can influence, I call them filters, but they can influence uh, the expression from the coded genotype, what's actually being programmed, to what is actually being expressed. And so as the coded genotype passes through those filters, we expect to see changes in the expressed genotype. So these are some of the things, and these factors provide additional sources of variation for the expressed genotype, and that's the phenotype. The expressed genotype is the phenotype, right? And um, we are still in the process of trying to understand what do some of these sociocultural environmental factors, what does it mean, you know, in terms of ethnic, ethnic identity or class structure or infectious diseases or uh, bioactive phytochemicals? What, how does that change the expressed genotype or some of the abiotic and biotic environmental filters like um, uh, high altitude? How does that affect gene expression patterns or diet or psychosocial stress? And that's why it takes bioinformatics to kind of make sense out of all of this information because it's too much for our little paleolithic brains. We have to bring in some machines to help us out, right? Oh, this one, I'm sorry, it's got some sounds. I couldn't get rid of the sounds. So 20, 25 years ago, when I started working on this project, what struck me was that um, African Americans were being considered in the literature as a homogeneous group. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. Because, you know, just even growing up as African American, I knew that there, was, there, was, uh, there were differences in the music, depending upon where you were coming from. And of course, that continues today. If you're, if you're a fan of hip hop and rap, you can tell where the rapper's from, depending upon you know, the sounds that they make. So East Coast doesn't sound like West Coast, doesn't sound like down South, right? OK. See, I may be old, but I know my stuff. <laughs> I got kids, and I got skills. All right. <laughs> So what we did was try to develop a strategy to analyze these geographical patterns of biological lineage data, okay? And to tie that, when we could, to what I call micro-ethnic affinity. I'm not talking about racial identification. I'm talking about who you really are. Yes, you're a black woman, but you're from someplace. And that someplace that you're from is going to have a huge impact on what food you like, you know, what you think is cool, what you think is attractive, you know. There's, I'm, this, this, I'm dealing with that level somewhere between idiosyncratic choices and macro-ethnic choices, you know. Regional frequencies of significant biocultural factors can be correlated with health outcomes, and we tried to identify those. And then we wanted to develop a predictive model for assessing group susceptibility to particular health disparities. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of background, and then I'll show you the, the cartoon. So this is that same map that you saw with the, with the regional, the county by county variation in either African Americans or Native Americans or English Americans and so forth and so on. And I concentrated my research on three regions, Chesapeake Bay region, Carolina Coast Region, and Mississippi Delta Region, because those were three regions that were major um, uh, areas where Africans brought from Africa or from the Caribbean were brought to those regions, and then they disseminated to the rest of the country from those regions. And we used historical assessments and geographical appraisals, uh, cultural reconstructions, uh, genetic evaluations, and then some of the databases on health risk factors, and pooled all that information together in this ethnogenetic layering strategy that we had. 
And this is kind of what it looks like. In other words, we collected and digitized the anthropological measures and created these geographical maps. Then we layered them, and in GIS, geographical information systems, you can create either raster or vector maps. So we did both, associating them with anthropological variables, residential history, genetic ancestry, dietary pasture um, uh, areas where Africans brought from Africa or from the Caribbean were brought to those regions and then they disseminated to the rest of the country from those regions. And we use historical assessments and geographical appraisals, uh, cultural reconstructions, uh, genetic evaluations, and then some of the databases on health risk factors, and pooled all that information together in this ethnogenetic layering strategy that we had. And this is kind of what it looks like. In other words, we collected and digitized the anthropological measures and created these geographical maps. Then we layered them, and in GIS, geographical information systems, you can create either raster or vector maps. So we did both, associating them with anthropological variables, residential history, genetic ancestry, dietary patterns, clinical details, environmental toxin exposures. And then we integrated the ethnogenetic and other data and then calculated a metadata analysis, and that allowed us to do some hypothesis testing. So you take the complexity and make it a little more simple, a little more refined. But we're starting off recognizing that there's a lot of complexity. So this was the ethnogenetic layering, and this was the first model we came up with that just talked about geographical residents. So these are the Native American groups in the three regions of interest at the time of European penetration of the Americas. Then we have the Europeans who came, but they didn't come as Europeans. They came as members of particular European groups, and they came to different regions. So in the Chesapeake Bay, you get, because it was a Catholic colony, Maryland was a Catholic colony, you get Ulster English, Irish, Scots, German, Scotch-Irish, and Welsh. Whereas in Louisiana, you get Acacia French, Spanish, and also you get regular French, too. The Acacia French, by the way, went on to become the Cajun people. And in uh, the Carolina coast, you get French Huguenot and Highland Scot and English Quaker, Scotch-Irish, Palatinate German, Swiss, uh, Swiss Spanish, and I think our oldest Jewish colony was in, in uh, the Carolinas. And then on top of that, we get the layering of Africans that were brought. And these are the proportions. We don't have the ethnic groups, but we have the, the geographical regions that people came from. So in the Carolina, co in the Carolina coast, you see that 40% of the Africans came from West Central Africa. Whereas in the Chesapeake Bay, only 16% came from West Central Africa. 38% came from the Bight of Bonny. In uh, Mississippi Delta, West Central Africa was only 25%. Bight of Bonny was only 8%. But you got a huge contingent, 32% from Senegal, Gambia, coming into Louisiana. Does that make a difference? Well, it should because the greatest amount of human genetic variation is in Africa. It's still in Africa. It always was in Africa because humans originated in Africa. Just like the greatest diversity in cabbages is where cabbages originated, okay? <laughs> so this is like simple biological, this is, not, this is not political. This is simple biological principles. Where a species has originated, by and large, is going to, you're going to find the greatest diversity because they've lived there longest. They've accumulated more mutations there, okay? Plus, there's something about Africa that Dobzhansky mentioned, and that is that, that Africa is uh, the most tropical of continents. And so in the tropics, you get uh, uh, different patterns of evolution compared to uh, uh, colder regions or regions where there's less biodiversity. In each of these regions, Mississippi Delta, 
Carolina coast and Chesapeake Bay, you can develop a kind of relative risk looking at the environment and the culture and, and also the genetics together. So that was what we came up with in 1996-97, which I know seems like ancient history to you guys. <laughs> but we were pretty happy about it. So this is that same map again, and this is showing the predominant ethnic groups in a little bit better detail. And this is what I'm saying about the dissemination of, of the red areas. Those are the Native Americans, the American Indians. The lavender areas are where the African Americans are. In this map, the uh, uh, medium blue are where the Mexican Americans are. And uh, well, you know, this could be a whole lecture in itself just talking about this. But now what I want to do is superimpose on this map the foci for specific cancer and other health disparities risk. And you can see that cardiovascular disease is throughout the South. That in around the area of the um, uh, Mississippi uh, River, and especially down in the Delta region, you've got a foci for pancreatic cancer and for lung and bronchus cancer. Up in Washington, D.C., where I'm coming from now, got a foci for prostate cancer and breast cancer. And then up in uh, New Hampshire, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we know that some of these disparities are tied to the genetics of the population, the heredity of the population. We have a saying that no one gets off the planet uh, alive. Everybody's going to die of something. Every, we're all imperfect creatures. 20 minutes? OK, I'm good. OK, population substructure and the risk of hypertension. So here's a, a case study. So I've been doing some work in South Carolina. And um, South Carolina is really interesting. I mean, aside from the racism and stuff like that, is otherwise, <laughs> it's, a pretty, it's a pretty interesting place because you've got these little pockets of people in South Carolina that are, they look like they just like step right out of Senegal, Gambia, you know? I once got a ticket for speeding in South Carolina. Never do that. Never speed in South Carolina. But fortunately, the officer who pulled me over was this beautiful black man who looked like he just came out of, you know, uh, Senegal, Gambia. And I wanted to, I wanted to touch him, but I knew <laughs> it wasn't the right thing to do. <laughs> So the first thing I said was, I'm sorry. I know I was speeding. I was just trying to get out of, I mean, not get out of South Carolina. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you have these pockets, which are really interesting, because you have those micro-ethnic groups that I was talking about. You know, yes, the people are African American. But in addition to that, they call themselves red legs, or clay eaters, or musky or free moors, or Gullah, or Geechee, or, you know, so they have an additional regional identity that in the past has very much influenced their patterns of mating, their, their dietary patterns, the occupations available to them, what, a, what flexibility there was. So this is, is just showing some of the groups um, that are, are of predominantly African descent or have some African admixture in them. And so then I started looking at examples of other U.S. microethnic groups. And this is just a quick list, which I'm not going to read for you, but I'll make this list available. In fact, the whole slide presentation I can make available, yeah, to, to, to the uh, uh, participants of this workshop, okay? So these are just some different names. You'll see they're all over the place. Even here in, in Central Texas, we have the Winds. It's a Slavic group from uh, Lusatia region of Eastern Germany. I don't know if anybody, if we have any Winds in the audience. <laughs> so I was surprised when I was giving a talk in South Carolina, and as I was talking about these microethnic groups, and people, it was a community talk, people started coming up to me and saying, Oh, my grandmother said, that that's our group. And I was like, whoa. You know, because it's one thing to do thing, things intellectually, and then to actually meet the people. And, and they tell you, oh, yeah, 
You know, we're, 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 we call ourselves the, uh, the Sand Hillers. And, you know, I said, well, how did you get that name? Because they said, we're in the Piedmont area and the soil is very sandy. You know, I said, okay. You know, whatever people want to call themselves. But I said, could you give me a, 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 a sample of your saliva? <laughs> like, let's make sure that it's real. <laughs> So I have this feeling that you know, in, in the Carolina coast region, the population structure is going to be key to understanding hypertension and its sequelae uh, in this region. And, and this is an area known as the stroke belt. In fact, as I was speeding along I-77, uh, there was a big red sign that said, have you been tested for stroke? I had never seen a sign like that any place else except South Carolina. It's the homeland of stroke. In fact, they call it the stroke belt, and no one seems to know why there is so much stroke. But I think that it's ancestral genetics from West Central Africa, local population structure, epigenetic changes associated with physical exercise activity, and epigenetic changes associated with exposure to dietary sodium that all work together to create a, a as they say, a perfect storm for the population, because most of the population the African-American population in the Carolinas come from West Central Africa, which is highlighted here in green. I've said here the largest component, 40% of the enslaved Africans brought to the Carolina coast came from the hinterlands of West Central Africa. So that is Angola, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and the Congos. This is an area where there's very little sodium in the soil, and there's very little sodium in the plants. So it would be thought of as a sodium deficient area, except I don't really want you to think of it that way, because the salt conserving genes that's in this population actually are the norm for our species. And as you move away from the equator, because the equator runs right through Gabon, I'll just show you on here, the equator is right here. So as you move away from the equator, what you see in the populations, including the African populations, is an accumulation of pseudogenes. That is, genes that have the salt-conserving genes have taken on additional mutations. They don't work anymore. So that allows you then to tolerate more salt, because salt is a toxin in high levels, right? So what we're seeing is that most of the population, or 40% of the population, of Africans brought to the Carolina coast came from a, an, an environment that had very low levels of salt. So what happens when you take people who have a natural tendency to hold on to the salt that they're given and you put them in an environment where salt is in everything? Wouldn't that create possible mismatch and pathology? And that's exactly what we're seeing. And so now the stroke belt has emerged because it didn't kill them right away. So they, they were still reproducing. And the stroke belt has extended. And that's that whole area in red there. But the point being that the heart of it seems to be where the bulk of West Central Africans were brought who, who, to North America. And this led to what's called the salt hypertension slavery hypothesis, which you know, has taken quite a beating, but there's probably something to it. Um, the basic logic of the hypothesis is that uh, multiple primary historical sources suggest that not only were the people coming from a salt deficient area, but that the transatlantic middle passage would have also selected for salt conservation. Think electrolyte conservation. Because what happens when your electrolytes are screwed up? you die. So there would be a strong selective pressure for those individuals who could conserve their sodium and their other electrolytes uh, under the conditions of, of the middle passage. Individuals with enhanced genetic-based ability to conserve salt had a distinctly improved biological fitness and were more likely to survive, reproduce, pass on their genes to subsequent generations in the Western Hemisphere. Natural selection for electrolyte conservation, as I said, has likely been the norm throughout human history. So some of our dietary patterns now really are abnormal in terms of our evolutionary history as a species. Current patterns of excessive dietary salt intake 
create the potential for salt overload and higher rates of hypertension because some hypertension is very responsive to excess salt. You think about that when you're eating those Fritos, okay? <laughs> In the U.S., salt sensitivity is present about 30% of normal tensives and but over 50% of hypertensive peoples, persons and it's more prevalent in African Americans. That is salt sensitivity. So the transatlantic slave trade, that's what TAST stands for, the transatlantic slave trade may have created a genetic bottleneck for salt conservation in the surviving Africans by initially constricting genetic variability and then further magnifying the potential for salt sensitive hypertension in a dietary salt rich environment. So if you think of what an hourglass look like, looks like, that's kind of what the, the genetic bottleneck. So you have a lot of variation, then you have this selective pressure that reduces the variation, and then the, the pressure is relieved, but the, the population has changed once it was in that, the neck of the, of the hourglass. The population of West Central Africa near the equator, they have higher frequencies of salt sensitive genes than do other West Africans. That was a colleague Young from out of Johns Hopkins that did that work. And so we did a comparison of uh, hypertension in the Carolina coast versus hypertension in the Chesapeake Bay region. They have different, significantly different levels or proportions of West Central African ancestry. And what we think is that even though the phenotype looks very similar, hypertension in Chesapeake Bay versus hypertension in the Carolina coast, and these are all both African American populations, the underlying genetics may be different because their ancestors, the proportions of African ancestry differ from Chesapeake Bay versus Carolina coast. You guys understand what I'm saying? And then the Native Americans that they interacted with, different. And the Europeans that they admix with, different. So, um, gee, I'm almost at the end of this. Huh. This went so fast. I feel like I have so much more to tell you. But um, I'm coming to the end of the slides. So I've been talking a, a little bit about epigenetics. I've alluded to epigenetics. That is the genetic changes in association with particular genes. These are genetic changes often induced by the environment, but with the potential to be inherited from one generation to the next. And these epigenetic changes can influence how those genes express themselves, which form of a protein they actually produce. Because, oh gee, Robin, you remember the days when it was one gene, one enzyme? <laughs> and now we realize that one gene can produce multiple forms of, of, of a protein. And so which protein is being produced may be very much influenced by the chemicals, the epigenome that's in association with that gene. We also know that these, the epigenome can be inherited. I think the maximum time has been four generations that people have seen. That means for, for oldsters like me, I'm still carrying some markers from slavery, from when my ancestors, my great, 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 great grandmother was enslaved. So, the idea with epigenetics and the mismatch theory is that you have a unique genotype with genetic variation, localized and copy number variation, and then that will generally produce the first phenotype. But in the presence of epigenetic changes, you could get one of, one of two other phenotypes. If the prediction that my mother had when she was carrying me in her womb, if it was matched once I was born, and I was exposed to that, the environment, then I'm physiologically better adapted to that environment. Say it's an environment of scarcity that I put here. If, if, if I've been groomed for an environment of scarcity in utero, then when I'm born, or when you're born, to a scarce environment, you're like, nothing, no big deal, right? On the other hand, if you're born to uh, an environment of abundance, but you were groomed for an environment of scarcity. Don't you see where that's a perfect storm for disorder and pathology? That in fact, 
The pathology is when the prediction is not matched. And so what we've been trying to do, and when we keep talking about health disparities and precision medicine, what we're trying to do is optimize each one of your phenotypes, given the predictions that, that you developed as a fetus in your mother's womb, what you've inherited genetically, what you've inherited epigenomically, so that we can produce phenotype 2, a physiologically optimum individual, as opposed to phenotype 3, a pathologic individual. Because when we're talking about health disparities, we're saying there's a mismatch. Something's wrong. That's simply what I've just said to you here. So the summary is, genetics can uncover previously hidden genetic variation, but it, by alone, it does not provide the needed cultural and historical context for accurate interpretation. The genetics can tell us, oh yes, you have uh, 1.3 percent of your genome is derived from Neanderthals, but it doesn't tell us when you got it, when, when you got that, those Neanderthal genes. It doesn't even tell us what those genes will mean until we look at them in the larger context of your entire genome. Ethnic identity is a more complex adaptation than the presence or absence of sim simple genetic sequences. It's dynamic and sociocultural. And it's really important not to confuse, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Jones reminded us, don't confuse cultural identity and, and genetic predisposition. Because you can find sickle cell in someone who is of European descent. That's possible. And there are thousands of cases of people with sickle cell who happen to be Greek or happen to be Turkish, you know? So, it's more, so much more complex than our little minds. We want to link things together that really are not linked in, this, in the, the way we imagine. Substructure exists in all large populations. That's a natural human phenomena. I was talking with someone earlier today about our Paleolithic minds and how we can only handle about 50 to 100 people that we know. All y'all people who think you have 1,000 Facebook friends, those people are not your friends. <laughs> Stop tripping. They're not your <laughs> friends. Substructure. We divide the world down into smaller bunches so that, so that we can manage it, given our brains. Ep epigenetics promises to play a major role in addressing the nuance of human genetic diversity and the development of accurate precision medicine. So I love epigenetics because, you know, Robin, as we were saying, this is a total game changer. It's like what, what, what people thought was written in stone, you know, uh, kind of the, the takeoff on Freud's statement that anatomy is destiny, destiny. It was this idea that genetics is destiny, and you can't do anything about it. You're just stuck with it. And it's like, uh-uh, wrong, wrong. There's epigenetics. We can change. We can change patterns of gene expression. We can change the expressed phenotype, expressed genotype, which is the phenotype. Finally, the interdisciplinary approach of biological anthropology can significantly contribute to the identification of the origins and resolution of health disparities. And I don't mean to say that just to, to toot my own horn. I'm just saying that looking at things in a, a more, uh, let me put it this way, to be tolerant of ambiguity. To be tolerant of ambiguity is a really good thing because there's a lot of ambiguity out there and you just need to be able just to deal with it and keep on doing your work. You know, don't try to nail everything down. Try to understand how, how things interact. In fact, that's the, the, the biology of the 21st century is interactive biology. How do living organisms interact with each other, okay? Because that will determine our success in the future as a species and the success of the planet. Thank you all very much. So we have a few minutes of, that we could ask some clarifying questions of Dr. Jackson. Would anyone like to ask a question? Uh, and, and then we'll have a short break, and then we'll have two more talks, and then we'll have this panel discussion.
Any questions? Come on down. Yeah, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. With the scarcity, uh, going into an environment of abundance, and you said that would be a perfect stone, storm, kind of what, what exactly do you think that would look like? So we've had, well, I think it, what it looks like is metabolic derangement. Okay. It looks like obesity. It looks like uh, great, I mean, I'm talking about greater potential for these things, okay. not absolute. Greater potential for metabolic derangement, greater potential for obesity, greater potential for, for um, uh, uh, cardiovascular disorder, uh, probably uh, osteological disorders, because, you know, it's kind of like a cascade effect. All you, you get one thing wrong and then all these other things starting to go wrong. I see some of the people in my age group are like, yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> All I did was stub my toe. Now I can't walk. You know? <laughs> Thank you. You know, and on and on. So, yes, yeah, so that's what I was thinking of, okay. that in terms of pathologic. Okay. Hi, Dr. Jackson. Hello. Um, it's this is my epigeneticist. <laughs> this is going to be the future of epigenetics right here. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I wanted to go back to when you were talking about ethnogenetic layering. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, what did you think about sort of layering on top of the ethnogenetic layering developmental biology? So you know yes. that in the context of cancer, we start now discussing in the context of epigenetics, of course, that um, there are windows of susceptibility, so where you are at particular times in your human life course, so where you right. live, you know, when you're, when you're born, and then where you live in, during puberty, and, where, and what, what your diet or your exposures are during yes. uh, pregnancy and lactation. Do you think that, you know, given the models that you've de developed, that we could um, start investigating the sort of plasticity mm -hmm. of, of yes. susceptibility? In, in, in these populations as you, mm -hmm. you know, sort of put a temporal, um, I guess, layer? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, as they say, and as the old people used to say, timing is everything. When you're exposed to something, you know, is, is extremely important. I mean, look, look at alcohol. Exposure to alcohol at a fetus versus exposure to alcohol in, right. in a 60-year-old, you know? Huge difference in terms of impact. And, and, and consequences. So, no, I think you're absolutely right. And if there's a way to integrate that, I'd love to do it. So maybe that's something we could work on, you know? Yeah, very good. So we have a question that came in from a, um, one of the other sites. Um, have your, has your research group considered layering into your analysis dietary historical trends? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, my, my, my husband, my husband, my husband, I've been married 44 years. Woohoo! <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how he tolerates me, but he does. And and so I. But he gives it, periodically. He'll give these lectures in nutrition at the dinner table. You know, <laughs> our eyes roll back. You know, as we're munching on cornbread or whatever. And um, but but what I've learned from him is how the diet has, our diets have really changed over the last 100, 200 years, even within the last 100 years. And so um, <clears throat> uh, I'm absolutely sure that the changes in our diet have had a, uh, have had a significant biological impact on our, us as whole organisms. Um, and we know that from short-term experiments, where people have gone back to a 1890 diet and their whole morphology has changed. You know, all the extra layers of fat around the middle have disappeared and they, you know, they, it, of course they've also changed their work, their work attitudes. They've been doing different kinds of work, like 1890s work, like chopping wood, things like that. But the diet is very important and, and there is kind of a cognitive disconnect, I believe, as we look at the contents of our diet and then our health. 
Like, just think about what you've been eating and the additives that have, and the colorings and all the other non-digestibles that, that you've eaten, and then our health. And maybe we are, in fact, in part responsible for some of the ill health, that, that, that it's a mismatch, that we're e eating foods that we're not that well adapted to. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I try and mirror that line question. Okay. But basically, I've been frustrated a little bit because of the way sometimes we just present ourselves in groups. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, I basically was trying to make a very big question, uh, more simplified, but I was going to say thank you for making such a complicated topic sound I mean, more simple to understand. Mm -hmm. um, so from what I've gathered throughout the week, like a lot of times we do um, compare black, white, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And it is frustrating because people like me are Mexican, American. Mm -hmm. But yes, I know my diversity is beyond that, right? Right. And so what I'm kind of wondering is, do you think it's possible that our outcomes should also be different? So we're always comparing non-white versus white. So mm -hmm. maybe it's reasonable to say that we're going to be a couple of standard deviations apart from each other for outcomes, and that's fair. Yeah. It, it, it may be reasonable. Uh, we certainly need to investigate. We certainly need to investigate where we stand. And then what is it going to take for us to, for each of us to get a fair shake? So the, the uh, I don't have a problem that, that we may be one or two standard deviations from mm -hmm. each other. If, if it all comes out equal in the end. But how do we know when we reach that? That's what I'm trying to figure out also. If it's fair to say yes, we could be a little bit variable in our outcomes and that's okay. Like, do you have an idea of like how we're going to know we're getting close or we're, and that may be like a rhetorical thing that may not be able to be answered. But. So I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but I, I think that there are some end measures. There's things like, like quality of life and length of life. And there are, of course, reproductive measures. And there was a scale that a, a, a Dr. Mays, who was a physicist, I believe, came up with. And he said that you can examine a population and the individuals in that population for a whole set of parameters. You know, are their nutritional competence, their, their intellectual competence. Their, and so in those measures, we should see parity even though the rate of development to get to, to a particular level may be different from one individual to the next. You know, I may master jump roping faster than you, but in the end, we're both physically fit. And I think that that's what we want to go for is the physical fitness, not a single standard. Just like we don't want a single standard of beauty, you know, we don't want a single, we don't want a single, single standard of what's considered a good diet. We want a diet that's best for me, or a diet that's best for you, or the best for the individual. And, and the, I think that, that, that it's, a, it's kind of a sea change in terms of our way of thinking, because we, we see a difference and we say, aha, it's a disparity, but is it an inequity? Because those are two different things, right? <laughs> There's a disparity in, in the time at which the average African-American child gets up and walks compared to the time that the average European child gets up and walks. But they both end up walking. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no problem, there's, there's no inequality there. There is there's a disparity, but it's just a disparity usually of a couple of months. Okay, I'm getting into the area of the pediatrician, so I should be quiet, huh? <laughs> Here she comes. <laughs> Okay. If I might just add to your answer, and I thought that was a very important question. Mm -hmm. I've also been thinking about, um, you know, there's the, the government thinks about when have we eliminated yes. health disparities, racial, ethnic health disparities, or any others. And so there are two ways of thinking out about it. I think that 
it's um, by looking at things over time uh -huh. and by looking at things across populations. So I'll say yes. both. So we, people say, have we eliminated the, say, group A, group B disparity after the difference gets to be this small, or is it when it gets to be this small, or like how small does the difference have to be? Right. And I think, in fact, what you have to see is that the difference varies randomly around zero over time. So that at one point in time, you might have a group A, group B difference, A is b bigger than B, but mm -hmm. then two years later, B is bigger than A or whatever, and when you get that difference, it's not how small does it have to be, but it's always positive, mm -hmm. or always negative, but is the difference varying right. randomly around zero. So that's sort of yes. a statistical way yes. of thinking, but it requires looking over time.